I'd now like to move on to the next session and invite Martin Collinson to come up and speak to us about his work, work in Cornier Research, please. Okay, well, I'd like to thank um, the organisers for asking me to come and speak today. It's a great pleasure to, to do so. This is me, Martin Collinson. I, I, I run a, a lab up at the University of Aberdeen, somewhere near the North Pole. And when we are not defending the place against polar bear attack, we do research into eye health and disease. And I personally have worked on the TAC6 gene for almost as long as I've been married, 17 years. Um, and during that time we spent about £2 million of taxpayer money looking at the um, basis of corneal health and disease in particular and in particular looking at the role of the PAC6 gene. So I'm going to try and explain today some of the outcome of that research and what it might mean for people who are affected by aniridia. Aniridia is, is kind of why we're here today, but the, the wider implications of corneal health and disease affect many, many more people than the people who are affected by aniridia. So injury to the cornea, infectious diseases, things like trachoma, and the other genetic diseases, which include aniridia, are the major cause of degenerative loss of sight, certainly in the developing world. So there's a lot of people who rely on science to bring new therapies for corneal degeneration. On the board here, are a couple of aniridic eyes exhibiting some of the things that I'll be talking about today. The opacity <coughs> is obvious, so the cornea becomes cloudy. And those of you close to the board might notice the vascularization, the ingrowth of blood vessels in, into the cornea. And these are things that we've studied in aniridia over the last 15 years or so. So on the left is a picture of the eye fairly similar to what James showed earlier. And most of our work is looking at the, the cornea, the, the, the front of the eye. And this panel on the right here is a microscope section through a cornea. This is actually a mouse's cornea, but it could, it could, it could be a human. And what you see, most of it, so there's actually not much there. It's, um, most of the cornea is kind of a, a, a protein called collagen. It's a, a, effectively a, a type of protein glass. And the idea is that it's transparent. But lying above all this collagen here, over the top of the cornea, is the epithelium. And that's, it's really a, a specialized skin, like the, the, the surface of your arm. But, it, but it's transparent. It doesn't have hairs and things. And the little brown dots that you see are the cells. And what we've done is we've, we've tagged a brown dye to the PAC6 protein. So all these little brown cells that you see at the top of the cornea are, are the cells that are full of the PAC6 protein. And they are the defense of your eye against the outside world. They're the ones that stop pathogens like bacteria getting in. The, 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 the cells that, that, that form the barrier that protect the eye from damage. So I'll repeat a little bit that was said this morning about how the eye protects itself from damage and how the cornea is maintained in a normal, healthy situation. So this is an eye. Although you can't see them, I've drawn them in blue there. Around the edge of the cornea uh, is a population of stem cells. So these are kind of like regenerative cells, cell, cells that never, never really grew up. And they, they sit around the edge of the cornea. And it's their job to provide new cells during life. And what happens is that each of these little stem cells around the edge here divides fairly slowly into two cells. And one of, one of the babies is in the stem cell. And the other ones are a replacement corneal cell. What they do is migrate to the middle of the eye. So, so across the surface of your eye, throughout adult life, the, the cells should be moving. The stem shell cells should be producing new cells that physically move to cover the surface of the eye. And this is happening in 
everybody throughout adult life. Here's a little cartoon that we, we, we drew some years ago. I want to, ex I want to use it to explain the, the healthy cornea and how it's normally maintained. So all these, so th these are all the PAC6 expressing um, corneal surface cells, the epithelial cells. And I sort of imagine it's, it's all this. And down, how do you know it at the bottom here? In red, you might just be able to see uh, the, the stem cells. And these cells divide to produce new cells, and they're babies, they're probably, they're probably sort of migrating, so they crawl over the surface of the cornea. Uh, and they, they crawl along the bottom layer first. And then eventually they'll lose contact with the bottom layer and form the protected corneal cells. But you know, the cornea, it's just like a specialized transparent skin. And just like cells are lost from your skin all the time, cells are lost from the cornea. When you rub your eye, when you blink, when you get a piece of dust in your eye, cells are lost. And there, there's some cells flying away. And yeah, there has to be a constant balance of cells being lost, being replaced by cells down here, dividing it, and, and cells moving across the cornea to replace the ones that are lost. That's the normal healthy situation. And some, some experiments that we did about 15 years ago kind of visualized this process of cells moving across the surface of the eye. Um, this is a mouse eye. There's, 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 nothing, um, there's nothing wrong with these mice, but we've just set up a clever little experiment where you can visualize the movement of cells across the eye by making the cells turn blue. And Here's the mouse's cornea. The stem cells are around the edge here. They're kind of here. And the streams of blue cells that you see uh, uh, is the process that I've just kind of described. The stem cells here churning out new cells, which then crawl across the surface of the eye to replace the ones that are lost. And you get these very striking patterns of cell movement across the eye. So a healthy eye, it happens throughout life. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the, the, the normal healthy eye situation. Um, but what's happening in unhealthy eyes, or eyes that have a problem? Here is um, an aniridic eye, a 12-year-old kid in India. You can see there's opacity forming here. When we do the experiment that I just showed before with, with, with mouse eyes, we do the same experiment on a mouse that's got aniridia. So just like people can pick up mutations in the PAC6 gene, there are mice that have accidentally picked up mutations in their PAC6 <laughs> gene too. And we, use, we, we look at those mice to try and understand the problems that are happening in, in humans. So what we try and do this kind of strike the eye experiment on an aridic mouse, you sort of see it, it goes quite badly wrong. That this stream of, of, of cells migrating over the surface of the eye doesn't seem to be working well in aniridic mice. As was mentioned this morning, we have to try and understand what, what the problem is with these corneas. And aniridia is regarded and treated as a stem cell problem, a limbal stem cell problem. And we've spent some years now trying to determine whether that is in fact the case. You probably won't see this very well, it's a, it's a little bit dark. Everything we know about limbal stem cells, where they are, what they do, what we think they do, is based on a surprisingly small number of experiments. The evidence is, is quite thin, so over the last three or four years, I've had some PhD students going back and looking at what limbal stem cells actually do. The dogma, what you hear, is that they, they sit around the edge of the cornea, and in response to damage, they wake up, produce some new cells, and, and the dogma is that in PAC6 cases, in aniridia cases, that, this, that these stem cells aren't working properly. Those of you who are very lucky, I can see some red dots on this slide here. These are stem cells. There's a, there's a, and it doesn't matter what technique we use, but there's, there's a technique that we can use to find the stem cells at the edge of the cornea and, la and label them up. And in this case, we've made them label fluorescent red. And this, is, this was done in a mouse, and we looked after the mouse very well, but we gave it a, a small scratch to the cornea, 
and then try to find the stem cells that wake up and divide in response to the scratching. And these green dots here are the cells that, that, that wake up and divide in response to, to wounding. And some of the red cells are also blue. So you've got, you've got some stem cells here that wake up in response to wounding. And, and they, they label fluorescent red and fluorescent green. And this is evidence that when you scratch the cornea, limbal stem cells really do wake up, proliferate, and produce new cells to repair the damage. You know, look at that. You, you are, in fact, the, the, the first people in the world that have see, actually, with knowledge, seen a limbal stem cell working. The next slide here, this, this is the only real sort of data science slide I'm, I'm going to show. The, the, the purpose of it to show it is if I get some poor student to spend um, a couple of months looking at microscope slides of red and blue set of green cells and counting them and working out how many there are, um, then what she can do, she can show, and that's what these graphs here are showing, is that the limbal stem cells really are there in a healthy eye and they're active and they wake up in response to damage. What she also finds though is that in older mice this same response doesn't happen. And, and the way we interpret this at the moment is that as we get older our, our stem cells start to slow down and lose some of the regenerative ability that we have as young people. So it's something to bear in mind, as pe whether, whether you, you, you have aniridia or, or whether you don't, it's something to bear in mind that stem cells are going to slow down as, as we get older. And that may have consequences for how our eyes work. But in many respects, I'm not too worried, because actually, we also have evidence that the, the eye, you know, it can get on pretty well without stem cells anyway. And, and again, another kind of fancy experiment that we did to show this was here, here again we have the stripey eyes, here's a, a normal mouse eye and this is an eye where I've done some, some genetics to, to take the stem cells out um, so this, this eye, it, it's, not, it's not a PAC6 eye, it's not an aniridia eye but it's an eye where I've done an experiment where the stem cells are no longer contributing to the surface of the eye and in that I see that the, the whole striking pattern breaks down the clearly that the normal situation isn't happening in this eye but importantly that this eye is essentially normal you know these mice can see without stem cells so stem cells and I'm not saying they're not important but they are not the be-all and end-all of how the eye stays healthy I said you can get mice that pick up mutations in their PAC6 gene well here's one of them this is um, a, a mouse with a um, mutation in PAC6 Here's its, um, one of its brothers or sisters. Um, in my, mice that have a, a PAC6 mutation tend to have smaller eyes than normal. Um, small eyes isn't often a problem with, with aniridic people, but the mice seem to get small eyes quite a lot, so they're quite easy to spot. We know from experiments that we've done that these PAC6 mutant mice do have limbal stem cells. And we know that these limbal stem cells work. They, they, they may not work quite as well as the normal mice, but nevertheless they are there, they can produce new cells that respond to, to damage. So it's not like the stem cells have gone completely. They may have a, yeah, they, they may be a little bit wobbly, but they are there. And we assume, therefore, that the stem cells are present in people with aniridia too, and they're probably working, but they're probably just not quite as good. It's not like they've completely gone. They are there to be rescued. So if I've said that, that people with aniridia probably do have stem cells, and that these stem cells are probably working, and that in any case the cornea can manage pretty well without stem cells, then why does the cornea tend to deteriorate in people with aniridia? And we've addressed a couple of aspects of this question. We, we know that people with aniridia have a mutation in the PAC6 gene, but what actually does the PAC6 gene do? You know, what, what is it? Does, it? does it build lenses? Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, does it make corneal barriers? Well, no, actually, it doesn't. It's kind of like a master regulator gene for eye development, like the, like the president that sits at the top of the eye machine saying, do this, do that. It, it controls other genes. That's all it does. 
And there, are, there were some studies done, not by us, a few years ago, saying that if you disrupted the PAC6 gene, you affected the function of 5,000 other genes in the eye. Now, we've only got 25,000 genes. So you know, the PAC6 is controlling, at some level, 5,000 of them in building the eye. So you can kind of understand why a mutation in one gene, the PAC6, causes multiple problems throughout the human eye. So I'm not going to describe all 5,000 genes that PAC6 affects, but there's one that appears to be really important, and it's the one that seems to control how blood vessels get into the cornea. There is a protein that we call VEGF, VEGF A. It's a protein that's made throughout the, throughout the body, really. But it's certainly present at the front of the eye, in the cornea. And it allows the development of blood vessels. It's kind of like, it, it's, I'm going to draw it as a little blue square. And it's throughout the surface of the eye. And it's tell, telling blood vessels, come here, we need blood. And normally, in the eye, you have blood vessels in the conjunctiva, the whites of the eyes, but they stop at the limbus and they don't grow into the eye. But if the eye is full of this chemical telling blood vessels come here, why don't the blood vessels go into the eye? And what we found a few years ago was that there's a second chemical, a second protein, that's acting like Gandalf, so you shall not pass. And it's, it's, the name doesn't matter, it's called s -flit. But it's made by the cornea. And the cornea produces this protein that acts like a sponge. It sucks up all the, all the VEGF so that blood vessels can grow to the edge of the eye, not normally. But when they hit the cornea, um, the, 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 they can't get any further because the, the, the signal is being blocked by this other protein, s -flit. That's why blood vessels don't normally enter the cornea. The problem for people with aniridia is that the corneas don't produce this sponge. They don't produce this s flit So what happens is that the, 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 the chemical VEGF A that's telling blood vessels to come in has nothing to tell it to shut up. So the, it, it's active throughout the cornea, and during life, blood vessels can start to grow in. They're not inhibited anymore. So that's one problem with aniridic corneas. This is one of the reasons why the corneas degenerate, because blood vessels in the cornea are bad. To a start, they're not transparent. But with blood vessels comes inflammation. With inflammation comes damage. With damage comes a disruption to the sort of crystalline collagen glass of the cornea, which leads to deterioration and cloudiness. What we found in mice, actually, was that if you give the... Uh, if you give the, the red protein, the s flip protein, back to the corneas of mice, the blood vessels go back. So there's a potential genetic therapy for the blood vessel problem with aniridia in terms of being able to give this red protein, this s flip back to the corneas. The second and uh, final aspect that I want to talk about in terms of why corneas tend to degenerate in aniridia is direct problems not related to the stem cells, but to the corneal surface itself. This is, it's, a, it's an electron microscope, it's a scanning electron microscope, looking at the surface of the cornea of an aniridic mouse. And it should be nice and smooth. It should form a barrier against the outside world. But this cornea clearly isn't forming a barrier against the outside world, because it's full of holes. The surface of the cornea in these aniridic mice is, is compromised. What that means, if it's full of holes, air gets in. And the eye, we know it is, oh, we know oxygen can damage the cornea at too high a concentration. And we know from some experiments that we did that the corneas of these aniridic mice are stressed because, they're, they're, because the, the barrier function of the cornea has been compromised. What we also know from some other experiments, is that they have less of the proteins that they need to defend themselves against stress. So the corneas of the aniridic mice, and we assume this is the same for people, although we haven't tested this, this yet, is that there's an increased level of stress because the cornea is fragile, it tends to get holes, it's not so good at repairing damage. Compounded by 
a sort of physiological problem that, that makes the corneas less good at responding to that stress. What this means in practice is that the aneridic cornea is constantly fighting fires. It's constantly under attack from the environment. It's constantly trying to repair small wounds. It's more susceptible to damage and it's less good at repairing that damage anyway. Over time, what that means is that, you know, the, the, it's, it's not a hopeless cause. The, the cornea of people with aniridia, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay at repairing itself. But over time, because it's under increased stress, because it's less good at responding to that stress, there is a risk that will start to deteriorate. And the deterioration could be triggered by an accident, poking yourself in the eye, in the old days, um, tonometers. You know, this sort of thing that, that, that cause abrasion to the eye can be what tips it over the edge. This takes me back to the subject of stem cells and stem cell transplants. Because in our, in our lab over the last 10 years or so, we've pretty much come to the conclusion that the primary problem with, with aniridia isn't the stem cell defect. That although it looks like a stem cell defect, it's treated like a stem cell defect. The problem probably isn't primarily the stem cells. It's all these other things that you see happening. Nevertheless, limbal stem cell transplants do work, um, at least temporarily. I mean, you, you, can, you can have a limbal stem cell transplant. It will improve the quality of your cornea probably for several years. So why, why, why do they work? And what we now think is that what happens when you get a limbal stem cell transplant, you get some healthy stem cells at the edge of the cornea here, and they get to work and they see all this damage and they, they, they repair it, they gloss over the cornea. But what we infer is that they don't last forever, that eventually they will go away and the underlying problems with corneal degeneration will come back because the cells are still mutant for PAC6. What stem cell transplants do is they buy the eye some time. They re-epithelialize it, so they, they restore the surface, give the underlying collagen, the glass, time to repair to improve sight. And they'll last and they'll stay there for a bit, but they're not the cure for aniridia or aniridia-related corneal problems because what's happening isn't, we think, directly related to the problems of the stem cells. So to conclude what I've said today, whether you have aniridia or not, your cornea is constantly fighting a battle against the outside world. It's exposed to oxygen, it's exposed to light, it's exposed to you poking yourself in the eye, blinking, chemicals, bacteria. So the cornea is constantly being damaged and it's constantly being repaired. So we have this system where stem cells repair the eye, cells fall off the eye, and there's a balance. And the, what we now think is that in aniridia, the balance between damage and repair has just been tipped a little bit towards damage. So that it's not like the cornea falls apart, but over, life, over your life into teenage and adult years, a progressive deterioration may start to occur. Because the cornea is more fragile than it should be, and it's less good at repairing damage than it should be. We believe that limbal stem cell transplants temporarily give the aneridic cornea time to reset the balance between damage and repair. But in terms of long-term maintenance of the cornea, it's clear that look, looking after the cornea is, is key. That means avoiding injury or stress. I'm not going to go and tell you to, to, to go and drink orange juice, but what we found was that, the, that if we gave vitamin C to corneas, they got a lot, a lot better at repairing damage. So clearly good, good health is important to main, maintenance of the cornea in adult life, whether or not you've got an iridium. I will finish there. Uh, I, I talk about all the work that we've done, but may, my, yeah, I'm like pack six. I just sit in an office going, do this, do that, do that. It's, and and the, the, these are the people that, that, that actually do, do the work. Amy Finley and Alessio Panzica have been looking at the migration of cells across the eye. Nada Saga and Kaya Kostanyevich are looking at the activity of, of stem cells in the eye. And this work was started by the two people you see at the bottom, Petra and Richard Mott. And that's me. So I'm, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions either at this time or later in the question and answer session. Okay.